I'm not even gonna lie, man. I left you guys on one hell of a cliffhanger in the last video. <laughs> I left you guys on such an insane cliffhanger. A part of me feels like it's not fair and I should probably start doing it, but another part of me doesn't wanna stop. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm evil. I am so evil. I'm a terrible person. I'm like a Viltrumite. Okay, so in the last video, we basically had this revelation from Alan the Alien when he was talking to Omni-Man, to Nolan, that they intended, or he intended, to basically release the Scourge virus on Earth. And that the Scourge virus is known to kill Viltrumites, right? It's a guaranteed way to destroy what's left of the Viltrumite race. The problem with this is that human DNA is so close to Viltrumite DNA that it could very well wipe out humanity as well. And so that's why you have no in here who's like right off the bat no right the people on earth are innocent have you lost your mind and that's kind of the crazy thing about this is that as this fight breaks out between these two this is a 100 philosophical argument right it's 100 philosophical we're not really debating ways and means here right we're debating whether or not it's morally ethical to do this this is in effect the invincible seemingly cosmic version of the trolley car dilemma so for those of you guys who aren't familiar with this uh the trolley car dilemma is a utilitarian dilemma basically by utilitarian being the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few and so what you have in this particular dilemma this particular scenario is that you're the conductor of a trolley train and that the brakes on the trolley train go out there's no way for you to stop it the only thing you can do is steer it one way or the other and that at the end of each one of these tracks is basically a deadhead right that like the trolley car will hit it and it'll stop and that'll basically be it however on each one of these tracks are people that on track A is one person, on track B is five people. Which one do you kill? One of those two groups is going to die. And so on the surface and on the front face, it's, well, you kill the one person. But then the situation becomes more complex when you start introducing variables. But what if those five people are criminals? Or what if you can push someone in the way of the trolley train and kill that one person, but save the people on both sets of tracks, right? But leaving out all those varying, you know, ideas and concepts, this is in effect a utility argument, right? That it's one of these things where Nolan takes the stance of, no, you can't take the risk of killing what could be an entire planet of people to eradicate a small number of people. And so that in and of itself is a utilitarian argument. The risk is simply just too high. That yes, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The few here are the Viltrumites who exist on Earth. The many are the innocent humans. And that without any concrete evidence to know for certain that the Scourge virus would not kill humans humanity is too big of a risk to take. But the funny thing about this is that no one is looking at this in a microchasm. No one's looking at this from the perspective of simply Earth itself. But one thing to keep in mind is that Alan the alien is now in charge of the coalition of worlds. It's not just Earth he's concerned about anymore. Now it's the millions of systems that are all part of the coalition of worlds, right? All those planets that exist out there, the countless number of individuals that would potentially die at some future point in time if the Viltrumites are allowed to repopulate their race on Earth, which is the bargain that was struck between Omni-Man and the Viltrumites, otherwise Earth would have been destroyed by the Viltrumites, that if they're allowed to proliferate, they will go back out into the universe and they will keep doing what they've always done. Now, there is a bit of a caveat to this, right? But the thing to notice is like, this fight is knocked down drag out, right? Now, one thing to remember here is that where Alan the Alien was previously weaker than Omni-Man, that Alan the Alien is one of these guys where he becomes stronger as he recovers from various conflicts that he's engaged in. At this point, in time, he's far stronger than Omni-Man is. He's pretty far above him. Do I think he's powerful enough to beat Freddie Mercury? No, but he's still pretty freaking powerful. Now, the funny thing is that in the middle of all this, suddenly Oliver shows up here, right? Now, again, Oliver, as you guys know, basically the youngest son of, uh, of Omni-Man and he goes to attack Alan the alien. And so when he initially gets the upper hand, it basically kind of stops the fight by just kind of like, okay, everybody chill out. What's going on here? At the same time, of course, you also have basically the military forces of, of Alan the alien that show up. And so ultimately you have this scenario where it's explained by Alan the alien to Oliver what's going on, right? That there's this idea that the Viltrumites exist on Earth, that a deal was brokered between Nolan and the and, and Freddie Mercury, right? The, you know, Thrag, the leader of the, of the Viltrumites, that as long as the Viltrumites were allowed to stay on Earth, they would interbreed with humanity, but they would also teach them to basically become members of the Viltrumite race, at least their offspring anyway. And that at some future point in time, presumably a thousand years, the Viltrumite race would be back up to their previous numbers and they would leave earth and they would go back out into the universe and basically do their own thing. And this was done because had Nolan and Mark stood against General Thrag, had they stood against Freddie Mercury, he would have killed him. 
He would have he would have beat them to death and then he would have killed humanity. And that basically would have been it. Or he would have beat them to death, killed all the superheroes on Earth, and then conquered the world and turned it into a breeding ground. And so as a result of that, the only way to basically keep humanity safe and to keep themselves alive was to broker that deal. But in the mind of Alan the alien, at the end of the day, the destruction of the Viltrumite race has to be the number one priority here. And when all this is explained to Oliver that the Scourge virus could very well kill humanity, but the deaths of 7 billion people on some backwater world in order to prevent the future deaths of countless people is worth the risk, right? And so when this explanation is given to Oliver, Oliver basically stands against Omni-Man and says, he's right. He's absolutely right here. Yes, it sucks it is humanity, but at the end of the day, he's like, we can warn Mark and, and Adam Eve. Mom's already here. There's no one else on that world that I care about. And the universe will scarcely even know they existed in the first place. And so if the greater universe is basically unaware of humanity's existence outside of the fact that the Viltrumites are there, which is the only reason they even know Earth exists, and that their deaths would basically go unnoticed and unmissed by anybody, does it really matter that they die? And what this does is it brings in this really, really interesting argument of a hierarchy of value. We as people, we create a hierarchy of what matters most. We create a hierarchy of who matters most in society. Here's a really good example. If your favorite celebrity in the whole wide world came to you and said, hey, uh, my car ran out of gas down the road. I need five bucks. Can you give it to me? You'd probably give it to them. But if a homeless person came up to you and said the same thing, you would probably turn them down. The irony of this being, you don't know any more about that celebrity than you do about that homeless person. You know who that celebrity is in the public eye, but who people are behind closed doors is not the same person they are when they're in the public eye, especially with a celebrity where their career lives and dies by how they're viewed by society, right? They can't really be who they are. They, for the most part, have to be who society wants them to be, lest they see the end of their career. Yet, you would give them the benefit of the doubt, where you wouldn't necessarily give it to a homeless person. And so, given that kind of nature, it makes sense where Oliver is coming from here, right? He creates a reasonable argument in saying, like, there's no one that I care about. Now, a lot of that's also because of Oliver's detachment. He was never really raised on Earth. I mean, he kind of was to a degree, but remember, he ages faster than people normally would. And so, where Oliver looks like he's about 14, 15 years old, in reality, he spent maybe a couple years on Earth. And, like, that was basically it. He hasn't been there all that long. It's one of those things, because following Alan making his case, the response of Nolan is to make his case to Oliver. And what he argues here is that he is not an anomaly. He's not something that just sort of happened as a fluke. It wasn't lightning in a bottle. Nolan living on Earth for such a lengthy period of time changed him because of what he saw about humanity. When he had a family, when he got married, when he had Mark, it changed his perception of the world and it changed his mission in his life. That he was hell-bent on fulfilling his role as a member of the Viltrumite race and conquering the world, making it ready for the Viltrumites to do whatever it was they needed to do to expand their own empire and likely turn it into a breeding planet. But as he spent time on Earth, and as he became more and more attached to people on Earth, he ultimately chose to defect from that. But here's the thing, here's the big difference, and it's one of those big things that Nolan's basically skimming over here. Nolan killed the Guardians of the Globe. Nolan killed anybody who stood in his way or who would have prevented the Viltrumites from being successful in conquering the world. It was not until Nolan had to fight his own son, and his son begged for his life, that he basically changed his tune. That's what did it. That's what turned things around for Nolan. Anything else besides that didn't have any major bearing here. But the argument he makes is they're going to be on Earth for a longer period of time. Basically meaning they'll get to where I was much, much faster, right? They're saying they need to be here for like a thousand years. A lot can happen over the course of a thousand years. But the response of Alan the Alien is, but what if that doesn't happen? You're betting all this on yourself. You're saying because I could do it, they can do it as well. And that would be a true statement if we were talking about Nolan building a company or educating himself, growing wealth or something like that, right? I mean, if that's what we were talking about, improving his status in life, sure, right? Because the ability to generate wealth in America is not based on a superpower, right? You can't see into the future so you know what you should invest in or anything like that. It's fortitude, it's wherewithal, it's drive and ambition and the ability to make sacrifices in the face of already having made sacrifices because the sacrifice you're making is in pursuit of your own goal. It's not a sacrifice you're making out of the circumstance that you're in. And so because of this, it's one of these things where Alan is right here when he's like, no, like you're betting that this race that has been around for seemingly eons, that, that literally was born and bred with the philosophy of conquering worlds, enslaving the universe, that you believe that they can somehow change because you did. That's not true. That's not how that works. People 
don't always change. We're talking about a race that wants to conquer and enslave the universe. This is not a risk that we can take. And so because of the fact that Nolan refuses to back down and because he refuses to state like, yes, you know, I will, I will stay out of your way, you know, and I will let you do that, that he's ultimately taken by the, by the forces of Alan the alien, right? And then once he's able to break free, Oliver just kind of gets the upper hand on him for a moment, starts to pummel him. And then in that momentary distraction, when he goes to fight his son, he holds back and he stops and Alan the alien knocks him unconscious. And so when that happens, he's basically just sent drifting through space. And then Oliver actually accompanies Alan the alien to earth to help him fulfill this mission of basically releasing the scourge virus on the world in order to kill the Viltrumite race, knowing it may very well kill humanity in the process. And so following that, Nolan basically crash lands back in the apartment of himself and Debbie on Telescria. And Debbie immediately freaks out, right? She sees that like on the, the view screens and everything that he was fighting the Alan the alien. And her initial thought is that he's looking to conquer Telescria, right? That he was faking, he was lying, he was pretending to turn over a new leaf, all that kind of stuff. And that's when he says, no, like you misunderstand. Alan's going to earth to kill all the Viltrumites there, but he's going to kill everyone on earth at the same time. We have to go to earth. We have to find a way to stop them. And so with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Thank you guys for watching <laughs> Cliffhanger and I will catch you all later. Peace.